Welcome to the Connectfulness Practice Podcast. Here, we settle into the murky, tangled, and freaking hard parts of life to restore our relationship with the self so it can ripple out to the people we love, the work we do, and the world around us. If we can't fix what's wrong, then our grandchildren inherit it. In order to fix what's wrong, we have to talk about it. And we can't move that conversation forward if we're not willing to be real about where we are now. We have to push on the edges of what it means to connect. Otherwise, nothing will ever change. I'm your host, Rebecca Wong, and I'm here to guide you through a series of radically honest conversations about what it means to be truly human in all of its messy, beautiful, hilarious, and heartbreaking glory. In our collective effort of looking inward, we're starting to do the outward work to reconnect the world. While these discussions will guide you into the connectfulness practice, this podcast is not meant to be a substitute for the depth of work that you'd encounter with a licensed provider. If something in this episode touches you, reach out. That's where you initiate the ripple that restores relationships. You can learn more about my connectfulness counseling practice and my online offerings at connectfulness.com. Oh, dear listeners, it's been a while. I have been, um, well, I've been learning a lot. I've been immersing myself in a lot of different projects. And I think it's probably safe to say that pandemic fatigue has also caught up with me. So I apologize that it's been a bit. And here I am. And I'm pretty excited to be back because I actually also have a lot of new stuff to share with you. So there's going to be a few episodes coming out real quick, and then I'm probably going to take a break for a while again, and here's why. Let me first start by telling you what I have coming out. This March and April of 2021, I'm going to be leading another section of my very popular six-week online relational course called Supporting Your Relational Self. This course is based on the work of Pia Melody and one of my teachers, Jan Bergstrom, and we are going to be leading, I think this is our fourth cohort through this, through this course, and I would love to have you there. There's still a few spots available, so check that out. And then April 24th and 25th, I'm again going to be co-facilitating an RLT, Essential Skills Relationship Bootcamp, with my amazing colleagues, Julianne Taylor-Shore, who you might remember from a few past episodes, and our colleague, Victoria Issa. The three of us are gathering together. We did this back in October of 2020, and it was an absolute hit. It was totally phenomenal. We were completely full. And I expect that we're going to fill up again. I would love for you to join us for this two-day online relationship boot camp. You can come as an individual or as a couple. If you're partnered, I highly recommend bringing your partner. This is also a great place for therapists who are thinking or exploring or interested in the RLT model to come and really learn, really embody these teachings. Again, if you're partnered, bring your partner. And there are CEUs available for therapist professionals. You can learn more about both of those offerings at connectfulness.com slash offerings. But that's not it. I have one more thing that I want to tell you about. Jules, Vicky, and I, we've been up to some stuff. We're currently in the midst of producing a podcast that we're going to launch this spring. And it's called the Why Does My Partner or the Why Doesn't My Partner podcast. You can learn more about it at whydoesmypartner.com or whydoesn'tmypartner.com. And there you can actually submit a question that you want us to answer. These are going to be short form podcasts. So think like 10 to 20 minutes or so. And we're just going to be talking about whatever these questions are like, why doesn't my partner? So you can learn more about that show at whydoesmypartner.com. All right, and so without further ado, I would like to introduce you to today's guest, Kelly McDaniel. So 
I'm here today with Kelly McDaniel, psychotherapist and author of Ready to Heal and her new upcoming book, Mother Hunger, which is expected to be released in July of 2021. Welcome, Kelly. I'm so glad to be here. I've been looking forward to this time with you. Oh, I'm so, so glad. We're, uh, we chatted months ago, it seems, mm -hmm. and uh, in prep for this conversation, and I've really been excited to dive in here with you today. Well, and I can appreciate that you have a wonderful speaking voice, which mm -hmm. makes talking about something that can be somewhat sensitive so much yeah. easier. So yeah. um, thank you yeah. for sharing your gift with the world uh, and doing this podcast. Thank you. And thank you for sharing yours in, in the form mm. of writing and educating and, and teaching so many how to work through this really tough topic that we're about to talk about. Thank you, Rebecca. Yeah. So much of your work centers around, you know, there's a few different pieces that are coming up for me. I'm going to throw them out there, but then I want you to maybe put it into your own words. Good. Um, loneliness, disconnection, mm -hmm. isolation, um, dis-ease, um, all of the different things that we're trying to escape from. But mm -hmm. it all centers back in the relationship, in the earliest relationships, and then how it affects us through life. That's, what, that's the essence of what I get from much of your work. But I wonder if there's more that you might add to that. I do think that's the essence of the work, um, which is the legacy of chronic disconnection or chronic loneliness, but not just the kind of loneliness that um, I think is part of the human condition. The loneliness that I'm writing about, the loneliness that I work with is condemned isolation, which is actually not my term. That's a term from the researchers at the Stone Center in Wells at Wellesley, Massachusetts, Jean Baker Miller wrote the book um, Toward a New Psychology for Women back in the 70s. And she identified a type of loneliness that she calls condemned isolation because shame is woven into that loneliness. Yeah. And so the loneliness is compounded with a feeling that I will always be locked in this loneliness because something is wrong with me. So there's no way out. I can't change this. And I think that is a really lifelong sentence of suffering if no one can help. Um, what I'm also acutely aware of is that right now, because we're in the middle of an enduring pandemic, many of us are faced with loneliness. And I think if there's any silver lining I can point to about this pandemic is I think it's going to reduce the shame around loneliness and around oh, talking about it. Yeah. And it won't just be a woman's issue anymore, right? That, oh, and, and I think that- And a secret one at that. Right? Because yeah. there's so much shame with loneliness that we don't admit it when we're lonely. We don't want to share that we're lonely because it means basically that I'm giving away that something's wrong with me. Right. And I'm really hopeful that that's going to get uh, erased from- and and I feel like loneliness in and of itself is its own pandemic, mm -hmm. right? It, it it it's it, it's certainly. being really something that we're all feeling on a deeper level right now. We're more disconnected. We're we're, we're less physically present with each other, more in these two dimensional ways, perhaps. But um, yes, and the loss of that physical presence yeah. is a real reduction in a capacity for oxytocin. Mm -hmm. that we get from skin contact and touch and hugging and hand-holding. And um, I don't think it's an accident that animal shelters right now are kind of empty. Everybody's adopting pets um, yeah. and we need companionship and touch. Yeah. And, and I've even noticed that just seeing people in person, even if we don't touch, it seeing helps. people from a distance, there's something so different. Um, a, a lovely client of mine, I'm sure she'll smile when she hears this, recently stopped by to pick up a book that I left outside for her. And we happened to see each other in person from like 10, 20 feet away. And it was just such a delicious moment that we shared. And it surprised both of us because oh. of the bigness of the feeling that came through in that moment. Oh. We see each other every week online, but this moment in person 
it was a big one. Oh, that's amazing. And I, I get this image right now. Mm-hmm. You know how the Grinch at the end of the Grinch Who Stole Christmas, that heart grows and it just yeah. expands his chest right now. My heart is so warm and full from hearing you say that. Yeah. And I think that's how both of us felt in that moment. So there, mm-hmm. there are these moments of, you know, these things we need, this human connection. Which goes right back to the top, the title of your podcast, Connectfulness, that yeah. there are moments of connection like that, that, that really are our life blood. Yeah, they are our lifeblood. And that goes back right into what what your first book, What Ready to Heal, is really all about. Mm-hmm. Right? That lifeblood. And and what is it that um, you know, the, the subtitle of your book is Breaking Free of Addictive Relationships. And I think maybe a good place for us to begin is to define for our listeners what that means. Like what what are addictive relationships and why does loneliness um have such a big part to do with that? Okay. Sure. Um, when I think about a definition for an addictive relationship, I, I have to default to the standard definition for any addiction. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're always the same. You know, there are certain criteria that we meet um, before we can really say, I think I'm addicted to something, yeah. which would be um, continued use despite trying to stop. Um, negative consequences and still an inability to stop, Um, cravings and withdrawal symptoms when trying to stop. Um, Those are three of the big ones that, I mean, there are more. I think there's technically 10 maybe in the DSM, but I don't refer to that too often. Um, So when I wrote Ready to Heal, it was really about realizing that here as women, and I did write it for women, even though many men resonate with uh, being in an addicted relationship, it's not a gender specific issue. But what is gender specific is that women are raised to modify ourselves to be good relational people. And then what happens when we're um, taking those skills into a relationship from a place of our own heartache, um, wounding, attachment, injuries, and how could it not be addictive? So we have to be in the relationship, and yet we don't have the skills for it because we didn't learn them growing up. And so we really need a relationship. It's not an elective thing. Yeah. But if we didn't grow up around healthy relationships, we don't have the skill set. Um, and it's a risky opportunity for the relationship to become addictive, similar to the relationship with food. We need food. We need people. These two things are also very nurturing. And if we didn't have early nurturing, the opportunity for food to be addictive, eating habits to become addictive, and love and sex to become addictive is, is absolutely just huge. I, I want to just kind of put in there to maybe to soften this a little bit. Maybe this is my own people pleasing kind of piece coming through. Um, but I also want to throw out there another way to talk about addiction is sometimes a compulsive behavior, mm-hmm. right? It, it's a behavior where we really lose a sense of agency and choice, yeah. right? It, it becomes something that we're doing almost automatically, like breathing. A lot of the women that I work with that have come to see me since reading Ready to Heal, talk about how flirting wasn't really an option. It wasn't a decision. It was just part of the personality. It just wasn't anything that took effort. Yeah. Just like opening a bag of chips, you know, when once you're in the way, you're in that mode and it's time and you, you don't think, you just go. I think it's Gabor Mate who talks about addiction and um, kind of the early wounds that pretty much all addictions are looking to to soothe. Yes. And that the the thing that really needs to be soothed is the disconnect. And we soothe yes. it through connection. I think that's what you're also talking about, except I think your your work gets a little more nuanced because it talks more about where the interruptions happen and why that makes it so hard for some to really find connection. Yes. And that's the element of fear. So here's what I love that you mentioned Gabor's work, because what he says is that the essence of all addiction is abject fear. Mm -hmm. So what I'm going to do is tie that into the experience of disconnection when we are 
little people, yeah. like somewhere between the age of zero and three years old before we're really having language or autonomy at all. We most need connection during those years. And if we don't have it, if we're not picked up when we're crying, if we're not soothed when we're lonely and need comfort, not only do we feel disconnected, we feel terrified. So you mix loneliness and fear, and it's a breeding ground for addiction to grow. Yeah, it is. So there's nothing that prepares an infant, a human infant, for the solitary confinement of a crib without her mother nearby without the heartbeat she's heard for nine months. She's just not designed for that. And so generations of us were raised by well-meaning parents who were given horrible advice from experts to let that baby cry it out. That's not only a disconnection, that's emotionally terrifying for the developing nervous system. That little baby already has the limbic system in place and can feel terror but can't understand why because the prefrontal cortex is not going to come online till about five, six years of age. So it makes no sense to this infant. It's purely, it means a death threat. Yeah. And on so many different levels, this infant is not able to regulate themselves. They rely, absolutely can't, yeah. absolutely cannot, not even um, body not even temperature. Body, yeah. <laughs> body temperature, heart rate, breath, all of it. like all of it is reliant upon being close to. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So we're wired for connection. Mm -hmm. We are wired to bond. There was a really interesting piece that you had in the book, uh, Ready to Heal, that I had not read before. Mm -hmm. And that was about the difference, I think it was, between female infants and male infants around, I think it was eight weeks old, about when when testosterone starts kicking in in terms of a hormone for, for um, babies that are born of the male gender. Um, and how that's so different in terms of what bio, like chemically is happening in exactly. development. Exactly. Do you want me to say a little bit more Please about that? Please do. Yeah. Sure. I'm sure you can speak into it better than I. Well, I'm not, an, I'm not a scientist. I, I love research, but the research right now is coming at us so quickly and um, that I may, it's hard to keep up. But yeah. what I, what I've been fascinated by is that for testosterone it actually happens in utero that testosterone to make a male baby floods the egg, which all are female at the beginning, floods the egg to make a boy baby. And in doing that, kills off some of the brain area for social connection, mirroring um, things that little girls are so good at doing, reading the facial body signals of the people we love, the people we yeah. care about. We literally have more, it seems, neuronal capacity in our brain for this social sophistication um, because we're not flooded with testosterone to make us a fighting machine. Um, this is so interesting when I think about it also, like it, when I juxtapose it with all these couples that I work with. Mm -hmm who come in, um, heterosexual couples who are coming in, who are saying things like, why can't he be more emotionally intimate? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. I think it's just, um, and I, I'll also give the little notation here that I raised a boy. So I have a front row seat to what happens to our little boys, even the ones that, okay, so mine was, I, I mean, he was being raised by an attachment Experts, so there was no crying it out in the crib, and and I nursed him till he weaned, and I did everything that the experts said to do. But I watched what happened to my boy when I surrendered him to the world and the school system and the playground rules, where boys learn to be boys, and boys have to survive the boy code and learn to learn what it is to be a dominant alpha male or not. And I think for heteronormative boys, the rules require such um, a loss of empathy. Yeah. Like you can't be empathic without being shamed, without being ridiculed. And so they lose what, even if they're, even if they're being nourished, even if those skill sets are being nourished, many lose them. Yeah. Um, and it's really tragic to watch. Mm. 
and I think it's tough being a boy. I mean, I think in our culture, we're grooming fighting machines rather than people that know how to be intimate and know how to connect. And, you know, we're preparing these boys for sports and then maybe someday for war. And that's just not a good lesson for preparing them for fatherhood or preparing them to be a partner. Yeah, I agree with you. And then we have these... um these girls, these heteronormative girls that are growing up. And and I think I just want to kind of make space here too in this conversation that there are so many more people these days identifying in a non-binary way yes, that right. are really yes, challenging yes. these binaries that we're talking about here. Right. And I just really want to make space and hold them too in this conversation. Um, and I'm glad because I think um, the risk with talking about my first book, Ready to Heal, that was written for women. And I did say in the book, and this was written in 2008. So yeah. it's been a while, a while ago. Um, that, that some of the issues I'm talking about for cisgendered women here do apply for women who are lesbian, but lesbian women have uh, some real added issues when they are connecting in relationship and dealing with the love addiction that can come and be part of that relationship because both are carrying mother hunger, both are carrying images around misogyny and what it means to be a woman and what it means to love a woman and what it means to have a female body. And it's just so um, very sophisticatedly complicated. Yeah. And and then I think there's even more complications for people who don't necessarily, who, who are more genderqueer or, yes, who, you know, totally. There, there's just, there, there's a lot of other layers here. And so, so um, the unifying I, factor that everybody can identify with, I think, is the feeling, regardless of where you are on the spectrum of gender, is the feeling of condemned isolation yeah. and shame. And yeah. so I think that's where there's a common denominator that unites us. Totally. And, and, um, so much of that comes from the implicit messages we take on when we're growing up. Precisely. And I think this is a good time to define what implicit means Yes. versus explicit. Mm-hmm. So explicit messages, explicit memory, we have access to. It's part of our cognition. It's part of our left brain. It's part of our frontal cortex that's online. We can usually know where that memory and belief comes from. There's an explicit memory. With implicit beliefs and implicit memory, those form before our language. So if we're picked up and held and cradled as a little one, the implicit message is the world's a safe place. I'm a lovable person. Other humans feel good. That's not something we know consciously. It's just something that gets embedded in our cells. That's called implicit memory. And from that implicit memory of being held, we may have the implicit belief, I'm worthy of love. Mm -hmm. What you're talking about is many of us carry the implicit belief, I'm not worthy of love. Yeah. And that came from those first formative months and years and how we were handled and treated, fed, nursed, and um, groomed and cleaned and and spoken to. Yeah. And and then there's the whole... um, you know, I, th- I think it was uh, chapter three of Ready to Heal, where you talk about how the formation of the self really begins to emerge and how that happens through relationships. So as we mature, even beyond the age of three, we're in relationship and direct relationship with those that are caring for us, often our mothers and our fathers and whoever those carers are. And in those relationships, we're learning who we are. We're exactly. learning our connection to ourself. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. In fact, we can't know who we are if we don't have those relationships. Right. Um, and when those relationships are um, healthy and safe and warm, it's really beneficial for our development. But that's not who I'm writing for. I'm writing for the other part of the population where we didn't have a healthy reflection um, of who we are. We were raised by people that probably didn't feel great about who they were either. And it's generational. And so um, what came back to us were messages about um, not being enough. Yeah. And and those are the messages then that get internalized and that mm-hmm. we let then form adaptations to because mm-hmm. it's our job to survive. Precisely. As little beings. And so... Um, that isolation 
compounds the, the ways in which we need to survive because we start to take on these messages that where not all of us is welcome. So we start to split off certain parts is a, a big piece of what I took from your book. Well, that's well said. <laughs> did, I, did I write about that? <laughs> you did. You did. You wrote about that. <laughs> well, it's so interesting. <laughs> I'm so glad I did because I know much more about that now than I did back then. But um, we do literally split off into parts. We have different selves. We have parts of ourselves that get frozen in time based on what might have been happening. So we all might have a little person inside who's kind of always walking around scared. Yeah. Then we may have a teenager inside who's always walking around really pissed off or very compliant. Um, and then I we want to have- circle. I just want to note that to circle back because anger is one of those things that we get so many mixed messages around. And so I, I don't necessarily, I want to keep talking about these parts, but then I want to come back to this. Well, I, I think anger is a, a good topic, especially related to my first book about addictive relationships because yeah. eroticized rage is part of what happens. Like when we're dealing with chronic disconnection and we have to adapt parts of our personality to try to earn little bits of approval and love from our caregivers, deep down, we're pretty angry about that. Yeah, we are. And if we can't know that we're angry, it's not safe to know that we're angry because it doesn't fit with being a good daughter or a good woman or a good person. Um, We're going to find other channels for that anger. And one way is to eroticize it. Mm. Mm. So a lot of what happens in addictive relationships is uh, anger is being eroticized and that can be a power play. So a power play from a place where you feel powerless. Precisely. You feel so disempowered. So one way to get the power is to um, Eradicize flirt, it. flirt, uh-huh. seduce, um, take an emotional hostage. Um, yeah. Wow. Yeah. 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 And, and there's another big piece to this because, um, one of the things that's not happening for all of these parts that are living inside is that they're not really receiving much soothing from their carers right. or um, really being permitted to find much pleasure in their lives. Okay. I'm so glad you brought that up because the flip side of erotic rage that's acted out mm-hmm. by flirting, seducing, the flip side is it's acted in. Yes. So because there's no soothing for the deprivation, for the disconnection, the shutdown response is so thorough that there's a loss of pleasure. Yeah. So for some women that find themselves in an addicted relationship, um, they really are so completely shut down to their body's sense of need and want and pleasure that their partner's the one that's doing all the flirting and seducing while they're just kind of frozen. Mm-hmm. They're there physically, but they can't really walk into the relationship because it would require too much of a self. And that self has been hidden. thoroughly hidden. Yeah. 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 And and that comes back to the loneliness the child initially experienced. Exactly. The child learned early on that if I'm going to be able to survive in this family system, I'm going to have to disappear. And that disappearing act is so thorough that the self doesn't develop. And this is also why there can be so much ease and comfort with dissociative states of being kind of, I'm here, but I'm not here. Mm -hmm. I lost track of time. I don't have much memory. Um, There's a lot of dissociating that goes on when we have to swallow who we are and not be present because it's just too unbearable. Yeah. And this happens mostly when caregivers, maybe they're not a tuned in caregiver, that doesn't necessarily create a need for dissociation. Dissociation happens when there's chronic fear and toxic stress that comes from caregivers that truly are um, unkind, cruel, and abusive. These can be siblings that are scary. These can be parents that are scary, whatever. But if you're if children are being raised with chronic, toxic fear, auto-regulation is how to cope. And I talk about this in Ready mm-hmm. to Heal. Auto-regulation that's... that's um, very evident that we can see is thumb sucking. You know, mm-hmm. that happens young, and it's a way that a child has access to calm 
his or her own nervous, nervous system, system mm-hmm. because there's no there's no co-regulating going on. Right. We can't co-regulate. And that's what we're actually designed for. That's so, the missing link is the that's co-regulation. The missing, exactly. And so we sub, what, yeah. That's mm-hmm. the setup for addiction. Yeah. Is that when we learn so young to auto-regulate, it's not a huge leap to continue auto-regulating with food or to Mm -hmm. continue auto-regulating with fantasy of being rescued by Prince Charming, Mm -hmm. or auto-regulating with television, or auto-regulating with exercise and work, anything that'll soothe us. Or masturbation, or sex. That's right. Or whatever. Masturbation and food are the first two things we have access to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. And fantasy. Yeah. 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 And, And all of these things can be really healthy. Sure. And all of these things can also be compulsively sought to seek comfort in that auto-regulatory kind of way when there's a deeper need that isn't being met or healed. Well said. And I, I, I guess I just want to emphasize that people come to see me for help. They come because they're not in that... <laughs> of the population that has secure attachment. We're not talking about those folks. Folks with secure attachment, they know how to enjoy the benefit of co-regulation. They've grown up in it and they don't need to misuse masturbation or love or fantasy or food. That's not who we're talking about. The 50% of the population that has an insecure attachment style of some way, shape or form, whether that's avoidant, anxious, or um, more disorganized, that's, those are the folks that have been wired to auto-regulate. And it's a, I think it's so crazy that it would pathologize this behavior because it's pure survival. And it's half of us, at yeah. least. That's what the science it's, says. It's at least I think, half of us. I think that's conservative, but that's what the science says. Yes. <laughs> you know, I, I think another huge piece of this that um, that I really take away from so much of this work is how confusing these systems are to grow up in. Yeah. Yeah. And when you say these systems, I'm assuming you mean the system of patriarchy. I mean the system of patriarchy. I mean our disorganized family systems. I mean, uh, you know, institute. there's so many different kinds, uh, institutionalized racism. Like there's so many different ways in which um, we are confused. And I think the family system is where it really all begins. But the family system, if we think about it, is part of the larger system. It is a social Mm -hmm. construct that is part of um, systemic racism. It is part of systemic uh, patriarchy and misogyny. And Mm -hmm. so the family system is is simply a reflection of the dominant hierarchy, one over, power over, dominant way of thinking. And it's just doing its best in this the system right? trying to survive. Yeah. And, yeah. And so, you know, when I, when I um, think about my own healing process and the work that I've done in my own life, I can't help but also think about the generations that came before me and right. what, what was both passed down, but also maybe even already healed before it was passed down to some extent, right? Like Truly. some of the stuff that we are all confused by and working with and, the system is is part of it's a part of the reflection of what's how that gets distilled through how that's filtered through generation after generation and it's not to point the finger at one individual and say mm-hmm. something's wrong with them but it is to kind of show up and learn how to understand what's happening exactly exactly yeah. i love how you say too that um sometimes we inherit pieces that have already been healed. Mm -hmm. Our mother or our grandmother may have already worked through some of the rigid, constraining ties of femininity training, right? The femininity training, in my opinion, teaches us that we must be good, Mm -hmm. be worthy of love, and we, if we're too sexual, then something is bad about us. And yet we've got to be sexy to be worthy of love. And so there's a total double bind in here. There's yeah. an impasse. Like you can't yeah. be those things. Mm-hmm. In fact, you're going to be one or the other. You're going to disappear in the middle. And which this is why I think femininity training is a breeding ground for love addiction and women. Mm. And if we're lucky enough to have a mother or a grandmother that already worked her way through this terrible impasse and found 
a bit of freedom, found a way to like her body, found a way to enjoy sexual pleasure, found a way to enjoy being feminine, but also being strong and um, wise. That's a that's a huge gift that we inherit. Yeah. Many of the women I work with did not have mothers that worked through that or grandmothers that worked through that. And I think it's a really tough deal. Um, but that's a neat thing that you say that that yeah. if we get to we get the benefit of yeah. ancestors that might have worked through that. And and we we also have some ancestors that might have done some of the work, but not all of it. Sure. Or have done some but not other, right? Like so they might yeah. have worked through certain burdens, but not other burdens. And so, you know, we we get a mixed bag. We we have humans raising humans. We do. Yeah. (laughs) So maybe our mother worked through some issues around career, but now that now we got that inheritance, now we got to work through the stuff on our body. Yeah. Yeah. Or the food or the sex or whatever the thing is that's coming up. Yeah. And, and so much of it in many ways, I think comes back to power or powerlessness and how that's wielded. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And power is really, um, mismanaged often yeah. in the world we live in. And so it doesn't, it's not surprising that it is mismanaged in our families. Yeah. And there's a lot of really covert ways that that power gets mismanaged in our families. Mm-hmm. Um, you talk about some of that, um, especially when you're talking about things like covert sexual abuse, not the overt right. sexual abuse that many of us are really familiar with when right. we think about sexual abuse or incest or stuff along those lines, but the more covert forms of sexual abuse that happen within families. Do you want yeah. to talk a little bit about that? I'd be happy to. Um, in clinical circles, we talk about covert sexual abuse, covert emotional abuse as enmeshment. Mm-hmm. So some of your... Um, Listeners may be more familiar with the term enmeshment. What I'd like to emphasize is Mm -hmm. that with covert sexual, emotional abuse slash enmeshment, Enmeshment. what we're really dealing with is a paradigm where the psychological relationship between parent and child gets inverted. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the parent looks to the child for soothing, for affirmation, for companionship. And those things get loaded onto the child who's trying to grow up and grows up realizing, I have to take care of my mother or father emotionally, um, physically by hanging around the person, um, psychologically by bolstering them, cheering them up, caring for their moods. So what this does, in fact, even if there's no inappropriate touching, is it forms a psychological emotional marriage where the child feels responsible for the well-being of the parent. In other words, the child becomes the parent's partner instead of the parent's actual partner. Now, this can happen when a parent has a partner or not, because many people rely on their children because it's a shortcut, really. You know, the children children already adore you. Mm-hmm. And so how wonderful. And so for for parents who have not had the capacity yet to develop emotionally, yeah. they're not yet mature. So they've been arrested themselves emotionally. They don't know how to make friends. They don't know a safe, good way to feel powerful and feel good about themselves. Very easily take on their children as an emotional partner. Yeah. And what will happen with these children, they'll grow up and have symptoms of incest survivors. Um, they they present very similarly. They have no boundaries. Um, this comes out in sexual, romantic relationships and friendships. And many kids who have grown up this way will delay having close friends or partners because they feel on some level they're betraying their parent. Mm-hmm. So it's a it's a tough deal. And it's very covert because it looks like, oh, I've got such a cool mom. She's my best friend. We even romanticize it in our culture by saying mini me, my little bestie. You know, it just kind of makes me crazy. Yeah. Um, and so, so it makes it really hard to identify. Yep. Right? Especially when pop culture is romanticizing it. Yeah. 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 And and then there's the common, well, so many other people had it worse than me. Right. So, um, so I right. can't really see the thing that's happening in my life or to me. Um Precisely. And the truth is that early on, a a developing child who is 
kind of the apple of their mother or father's eye, the Mm -hmm. chosen child. At first, that feels pretty darn good. Yeah, it does. It feels like a privilege. It feels special to be chosen. We all want to be the favorite. It, It takes a long time to identify this form of emotional um, hardship. Yeah. yeah. But it, it truly is a boundary violation. And that's, that's why so often um, on the other side of it, there's that ick feeling. There is an ick feeling, especially when as an adult, um, if you've experienced enmeshment and you try to get close to someone, yeah, you might feel really icky. As you get older and your parent start spending the same, has these needs from you, it mm-hmm. starts to feel icky. You yeah. just kind of feel like you're having an allergic reaction. Yeah. And it, one of the things you mentioned in the book that I thought was was really important is that that ick feeling is mm-hmm. actually a feeling of shame. And it's a feeling of shame that the parent should have felt. Precisely. They're not feeling it because they don't know they're doing anything inappropriate. So we carry that for them. Yeah. And then yep. that... We carrying it for them is mm-hmm. part of the contortion, part of the backwardsness of what's happening that then teaches us how to be in relationship. So we then learn to be in relationship through this backward, contorted space of pleasing others, of not saying no, of not listening to our own needs. And that is then what we act out later in life. Exactly. It's all we know. That's what we've been breathing in. That's the air we know. The air we know is full of shame and full of responsibility that's not ours. Yeah. Mm. It's big. It is. It's so big. It is big. And this might be a good time to just throw out a note of encouragement, (laughs) which (laughs) which is that, yes, this is big. There are just so many ways we can be harmed as little ones, right? We're so vulnerable. Mm -hmm. We're so dependent. Which we're supposed to be when we're Which we're supposed to be. That's not a character defect, right? And then we grow up and our adaptations put us into all kinds of situations that then we have to recover from. Mm -hmm. So- what I do want to say is I wouldn't have written this book if recovery were not possible. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, we wouldn't be having this conversation if we couldn't heal. We wouldn't be having this conversation if our brain was then doomed to be the same way it was when we were seven years old. Right. So right. anyway. Yeah. Well, so so that might um, guide us right there is, is that maybe that's a huge piece of this conversation, that once we start moving through recognizing that this is part of the issue and that maybe we're not defective and maybe we are lovable and um, we just never were really taught that, then what? Well, great. And first of all, even realizing that, yeah, even realizing that, that there is a reason why we do what we do is, is really such a breath of fresh air. And what I have found is that our brain, the minute the brain has a name for what we're doing, which is why, even though love addiction is not a great name, yep. because really, it's just not. Um, it it's so helpful if it identifies a pattern, and the brain once it captures the name starts to do what the brain's going to do, which is heal. The brain is designed to heal. I mean, the minute we get out of our own way, healing is going to start to happen. But we can't get out of the way until we've got a term, which is why I guess we're pretty familiar with that phrase, if you name it, you tame it. There's so much truth in that, which is why I've also come up with the name Mother Hunger, because I think the men and a woman hears that term. Yeah. When I've seen this over and over in my office, there's a thud in the middle of the room. Well, because it's recognizable. Yeah. It's like, yeah. That's it. Yeah. And so the whole body loves that. So when we're talking about what do we do next to recover and to mm-hmm. heal, you've already identified the biggest piece, which is, okay, we just realized that the reason we have an addictive relationship might not be because we're broken. Right. It may not be because we're defective. So you've already done some of the work right there. Then, yes, how do we heal from this? And I, I think there's a couple of ways we can talk about that, which is we could get very specific about how to heal from love and sex addiction, because that's what mm-hmm. the first book is about. Or I could talk more generally, maybe both, about what healing is actually doing. What we're actually yeah. doing in attachment language is earning the secure attachment we didn't have as children. The one that's really our birthright. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Can, can I back us up just for one second before we talk about that? Yeah. Because there, there's one paragraph or so in your book mm. that I just, I think is really relevant right here. And, and I had highlighted it and put sticky notes all over it. And I think oh. I had intended to share it. 
um, what you wrote was that shame is the unbearable feeling of being unworthy of connection. It's the feeling of being shut out of connection because something about you is defective. It's the belief that you're not capable of changing this. And so the shame leads to loneliness. As we've learned, traumatic loneliness and lack of bonding leads to addiction. Com humans cannot bear isolation, so they crave a fix. And that fix can come from many sources, alcohol, drugs, gambling, food, to name a few. Exactly. Yeah. There's no mistake that the way we punish people, the most brutal way we punish people is we put them into solitary confinement. Yeah. And it literally hurts the brain. It hurts the soul. Everything. Yeah. So I, I think that what happens is that so many of us grow up in solitary confinement yeah. because we feel that it's something about us that locked us up. Mm -hmm. And I've had this defective. Yes. And mm -hmm. I've had clients say to me, you know, without having read that beautiful paragraph that you just shared, thank you. I'm like, wow, did I write that? Anyway, you did. You wrote um, that. It's in your book. I, I love that. Um, but I have these clients, they're so articulate, right? I think that this is the thing, too, about working with people who have addiction. Most addicts are so brilliant and so talented and so creative, and all that has been going toward the addictive fix rather than developing a personality. So it comes out in my office and I hear these great phrases. And one is, I feel like I'm in a cage of rage. Mm. Some have called it a cage of shame. But over and over again, I hear the word cage. cage. And that takes me to both the image of a jail cell or a crib. Yeah. Yeah. And that's taking me right now also to the children that are locked up on our border, separated from their parents. Oh, just It's just heartbreaking. Yeah. It's just heartbreaking. Yeah. So healing. How do we heal? How do we heal individually? How do we heal collectively? What's the attachment research take us to? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the good news is so many people are now recognizing attachment theory as the overarching explanation for how we are who we are, and how we love. Mm -hmm. And so I think that um, collectively, we are going to change. We're going to yeah. change the way we treat our infants. Mm -hmm. We're going to change the way we treat each other. Um, we're going to have to. You do. And it takes a while for medicine to catch up. It takes a while for the so-called experts to catch up. But um, you and I both know clinicians are on it. We're on it. And we and have know been for quite some time. We have. We totally yeah. have. And um, and hopefully more and more parents will quit listening to misguided experts and be able to find the growing number of resources that help us go back and find the wisdom we lost, mm -hmm. find the wisdom that was buried, find the wisdom that's deep within us that says we belong to each other. Our babies want to be near us. Yeah. Yeah, and and my hope, I guess, is that each of us, everyone who's listening to the show, everyone who wants to share the show with somebody, um, each of us do the work internally, because as we do it, we that's what we share moving forward. We we heal our parts, and then our healed parts help others heal their parts, and so on and so on and so on, and that's the ripple. And that brings us to the individual effort. Yeah. So you kind of asked, how do we heal collectively and how do mm -hmm. we heal individually? And I kind of hopped right to the collective. But individually, um, to do exactly what you just said, which is to heal internally. Yeah. I've outlined some steps on how to do that in Ready to Heal. You have. And is that what you'd like to talk I about? I would love to talk about that if you're... Okay. Yeah. You'd well, like I just... Guide us. Sure. I, I just wasn't sure maybe how specific to be, but when when one is making the big, big decision to heal from an addictive habit with sex or love, either. Um, and, and that can be an acting out or it can be an acting in. It can it's be either a way. It can be a withdrawal mm -hmm. or it can be like an over outward enmeshment. Sure. Sure. Um, and maybe I should be more clear with language that what we call that in the field um, for those that act in it's generally called sexual and emotional anorexia mm -hmm. and for those that act out it can be called um, 
love and sexual addiction. Yeah. Okay. Both are the same. They're coming from the same wound. They're coming from the same attachment injury. They're just manifesting differently. Um, and in different degrees, I might add. So there's not necessarily a one size fits all formula because we're all very unique in our relational patterns. Um, but there are some things that I've learned over the years can help us cultivate a new sense of attachment within ourselves yeah. so that we quit looking for it from someone else or we come out of that deprived, anorexic, socially isolated place. Yes. Makes yes. sense? Yes. Um, and the recovery process for wherever a person is on the spectrum is going to be different. You know, mm -hmm. if you're on the more outward end of the spectrum, it's going to be different. You're going to need to take a time out from relationships. You're mm -hmm. going to have to go into withdrawal. Yeah. And nobody likes to hear this. Um, and truly, I think withdrawing from a relationship, not because the relationship is, um, ending organically on its own, but because either you got rejected or the person died or your therapist says you have to go into withdrawal <laughs> is truly just the worst form of pain because we, we, it, 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 we're wired to avoid rejection and it's going to feel like rejection even if you make the decision to do it. So yeah. I've seen this time and time again as somebody says, okay, I'm ready. I'm ready. And I, I'm skeptical, but okay. And they're ready to start withdrawal. And within about 48 hours, the rejection is absolutely unmanageable and unbearable. So I really don't suggest going into withdrawal until you have a lot of support around you mm -hmm. from either other people that have gone through this process or um, a, a support group that's a 12-step oriented support group where people can guide you. Um, and preferably also a good coach or therapist yeah. who gets it um, because this is going to be the hardest thing you've ever done. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't work specifically with food and disordered eating. However, every woman who's got a relational addiction also has a food problem. So I, I, I have a lot of thoughts and experience and I do some writing about it, but my hunch is, but I can't, I don't know for sure that love addiction withdrawal, sex addiction withdrawal is every bit as painful as withdrawing from sugar, wheat, flour, um, very addictive substances. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, and what I've heard from people who have already recovered from drugs and alcohol, who then realize they got to recover from addictive relationships is that this truly is the worst. So I don't like to sugarcoat that because I, I think if you're going to embark on a journey of cultivating an inner self, it's really a good idea to have an idea that this is going to be the hardest work you'll ever do. It will also be the most rewarding. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it you, you just got to work. You got to prime. You got to prep. You got to work out just like if you're going to run a marathon. My hunch is that the reason it is, it is both the most rewarding and so incredibly hard in terms of the recovery process is because it goes right to the root system. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. Who we are sexually is who we are to the core of ourselves and essentially. And yeah. the way we love people, the way we touch yeah. our bodies or touch mm -hmm. someone else's body and the way we nourish ourselves with food, um, this tells the story of early attachment. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I, I often come back to the, the etymology of the word erotic because it's so much about just life, the eros, the life, the life force, right? And so that is... Um, it's both how we, we reconnect to the erotic through pleasure, right? And it's also how it is expressed through us. And it's one of those places where we can be, um, you know, on one side or the other, either anorexic or binging or, you know, in all of these different ways. Until we do, as you say, I just love that you pointed to the root of the erotic is eros, our life yeah. energy. So often in this recovery process, as there are things that we have to stop doing, yeah, there are things that then start happening. People yeah. begin to paint. They uh -huh. go back and reclaim the singing career they gave up. They go back and design the home that they really always wanted, or they go back to school, or what? Like suddenly, that creative energy that has been going toward love and sex, or has been suffocated and 
and restricted underneath the fear that goes with anorexia um, starts to bloom. Yeah. Yeah. And that's such a different investment energetically, right? Yeah. It, 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 is, it has a different um, vitality to it right there. Well, yes. In fact, the difference in the vitality so if we're going to talk of the difference about the erotic energy that fuels an addictive type habit mm-hmm. versus the erotic energy that you get to reclaim mm-hmm. as you get kind of as you get to know who you that, are, right? <laughs> one feels clean, one feels dirty. Yes. It's real simple. Like I have people say, "Well, how do I know if I'm acting out or not?" I'm like, "Well, do you feel slimy or do you feel kind of clean and yummy and fresh?" There it is. You know, um, over a year ago, I had the uh, pleasure of interviewing Resmo Menachem, and mm. he talks about clean pain and dirty pain. And when he does, he basically says, like, clean pain is the pain that goes through something. It goes right through the core of it. And dirty pain circumvents it and moves around. I love that. Yeah. I love his work. In oh, fact, my gosh, I, yes. I found his book, My Grandmother's Hands, when I was early on in the manuscript of my new book, Mother Hunger. And it was obvious the title just resonated for me. So I picked it up, read it voraciously. And it must have been probably six months after that, that Krista Tippett has him on on being. And because our world is finally coming into a front row seat of what we need to take a closer look at, he is now really widely known. And I just love that you brought him up. Yeah. Yeah, he was he was a fantastic guest. A, a, such bet. a delicious conversation. And, wow. Um, wow. Yeah, that was when was that? That it was probably about a year and a half ago now that I interviewed him. Wow, that's fantastic. So, I yeah. want to go back and listen to that now that I know. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, but I love the way he talks about clean pain and dirty pain, and yeah. that has become something that I I really. Uh, look to as a guide. And I think that's what you're talking about here too. It's the same premise, the clean. It's the same premise. Yep. Clean pain, we're designed to be able to manage and handle and work it Mm -hmm. through. Dirty pain is full of shame and it gets unmanageable really fast, whether we're carrying shame that's not ours Mm -hmm. from our caregivers or from a partner who's unkind, um, or it's our own shame from acting outside our value system. And, And we're not willing to look at it and work it through. Right. Yeah. 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 So, so the healing process begins there. It begins with identifying um, kind of where we are in that, in that process. Are we in that ick or are we in that clean place where we're full of vitality? And, um, which, which direction are we moving towards? Exactly. And I think it's fair to say that um, if you're listening to this and you are resonating with the idea that maybe you have a love addiction or a sexual addiction, chances are you've never even felt clean pain. Mm. You've only felt dirty pain and it feels normal. And so it takes a while to even differentiate. And my experience is that sometimes until a withdrawal period of some time, whether it's 30, 60, 90 days, there's no distinguishing clean and dirty. It just, it's too woven together. The fabric is too tight. Yeah. But once a withdrawal period is able to kind of um, fit into your life, Mm -hmm. then you start to have glimmers of what clean pain feels like. Mm. Because clean pain, you'll feel pain and withdrawal, but it's pain with a purpose. It's pain that's getting you to a goal. It's pain that is bringing you to your true self It's going to help you find that true self. Yeah, that's going to hurt, but it's got a purpose, so it's clean. Yeah. And so that's usually the first time um, a woman has ever even felt that if she's coming to me to work on an addiction. Yeah. Yeah. That is big. Yeah. 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 I mean, if ick is your norm, Mm -hmm. you don't know that, that you don't even know it's an ick until you feel something different. Right. And then you talk also about the gifts of recovery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I I think that these are also things that, um, gosh, we all need more of, all of us. Isn't that true? Yeah. So true. So you you very simply label them as self-care, self-acceptance, and self-love. Um. 
And they're so important, these three things, self-care, self-acceptance, and self-love in regards to how we enter or re-enter into intimate adult relationships or any kind of healthy adult relate or how we parent too. So any kind of healthy, intimate relationship. Right. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It has to start with us. Like yeah. it, we can't have compassion or empathy for someone else if we don't offer that. Internally. For, mm-hmm, exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we learn to take care of ourselves in a new way, in a way that we maybe wish we had been cared for. Yeah. So we stop looking for someone to do that. And by and by that, let me be clear. We stop looking for someone to do that that we're not paying. <laughs> like, I mean, it's appropriate to look to a therapist to model nurturing and protection and acceptance and compassion. That's appropriate. It's not appropriate to expect your best friend or your lover to do that perfectly for you, mm-hmm. to, to accept you unconditionally. And the yearning is there for it, though. The yearning is there for it. You want it. I get it. But uh, it's But pretty- so often it's those expectations or yearnings that get us into trouble in relationships because then we find ourselves in these relationships where like, you're not all the things I want you to be. Why can't you tolerate my fill in the blank? There you go. And then that's where that rage is going to pop up. Yes. Right? And, yeah, exactly. And or, or the withdrawal, you know, on one side or the other. Yep. And that's exactly the place where the work is because the work is always about turning back around and looking at yourself and, well, what is it that I'm not giving myself that I'm asking you to give me? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that this is where our unconscious is such a um, interesting animal <laughs> because, you know, I can be just totally unaware unaware of the fact that I am expecting my partner Mm -hmm. to give me in a moment, let's say, a sense of um, well-being. Yeah. Without it even occurring to me that, wait a minute, why would I expect that person to give that to me? If I am not giving it to myself, I must not really even think I'm worth it. And and those things just don't go across our conscious mind. Right. So this takes time and it takes patience and and a real learning curve. It really does. W- really, where we're even, yeah. And it's so necessary because if we don't engage in that in that slow learning, we sabotage the process because when our partner or whomever, our best friend, whoever starts to give us what we think we've been looking for, we don't believe it or we sabotage it or, you know, there's another whole piece to that that um, makes it difficult for us to take it in. Yeah, I think you're right. We really actually don't believe it mm-hmm. on a precognitive level. So yeah. the word sabotage almost doesn't feel fair because what's actually happening is when someone treats us kindly, let's say, yeah. but we've not healed, it actually can be overwhelming to our nervous system. Mm-hmm. So it feels like a threat uh. because the very thing we crave, our body cannot tolerate it yet. doesn't know how to process thought. it. It's like we don't know how to metabolize it, how to take it in, how to digest it. We really don't. Mm-hmm. And if there's a bigger motivator for healing, that would be it. Like we've got to teach our nervous system that we're okay so that we can receive that. And that takes a lot of time, especially if you've grown up in a home where there was abuse. Yeah. Um, even kindness can feel like a threat. Mm. I know. Yeah. 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 So noticing these patterns, noticing the ways in which, um, and this is a hard piece to notice. It's really hard to wake up to. This is really hard to wake up to because what we're waking up to not only is the reality that maybe the life we've been living, we didn't actually choose Mm -hmm. because we don't have enough of a self to choose it. We're waking up to grief. Mm -hmm. We're waking up to profound grief of the childhood we lost, most of the adult dreams that we didn't create or have, and maybe we're waking up to the fact that we've also passed this on to the next generation. So what I find is that when women embark on this healing, part of what freezes it is coming face to face with grief. You know, it's interesting though, because I, I, 
um, um, a few other conversations I've had on the show are, are coming into my mind as we're talking about this. And um, gosh, I've had such a wonderful collection of people. Emily Nagotsky has mm -hmm. joined me and um, we talked about uh, sex and burnout and all these different pieces. And one of the things that we ended up talking about was that really to get to a place of a lot of pleasure in our lives and in our sex lives, we need to walk through grief how important that grief is. It's like, it, it's what opens the doorway to be able to invite more pleasure um, and more knowing of ourselves into our lives. It's so true. It's so true. I mean, if we're going to run away from grief, mm -hmm. which makes sense because we don't have a culture that invites us to grieve or, and grief takes time and it's messy and it's anyway, so I or, get or that models how to grieve. And right. We don't have rituals that. Rituals around grief. Or and I'm going to say more about that in just a second. Mm -hmm. um, but to, to talk to your point about pleasure, like if we're running from the pain of grief, we're also losing pleasure. Yes. Like you can't yes. Dumb, you can't kind of numb one out and not lose the other one too. So she's exactly right about that. Yeah. But it, part of healing is facing pain, and that's going to bring a huge capacity for pleasure. Yes. So, so I just want to say yes, yes, yes to to what you just brought yeah. up. But I want to talk a little bit about this place that, that, that there's, there's no place to go grieve. And I think when we're talking about um, the attachment injury that is beneath an addiction, yeah. We're really talking about disenfranchised grief, which is grief that doesn't have a support group. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not cancer where all your neighbors are going to bring you food and you're going to be able to go to a support group and people are going to understand that you're grieving and they're going to give you room to grieve. They're even going to anticipate it because they know you have a diagnosis. When you don't have a diagnosis, or let's say even worse, let's say your diagnosis is something that the cultural frowns on, like, oh, what, you're going to complain about your mom? Um, We're not allowed to talk about mom. We can't do that. We no. can't do that. And no. so this is such a, this is such a real problem for yeah. healing and attachment injury because there's no place to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And you will be persecuted if you say it the wrong way. And that freezes grief. So the essence for me of addiction that won't heal is frozen grief, I think. Mm -hmm. And and so you have on one hand this disenfranchised grief, and on the other side is this condemned isolation. And yep. then you're living in the middle of all of it, and you're in the shame. How awful, right? That is oh. true suffering. It is true suffering. And it is known by so many of us. So many of us are suffering like this, and gosh, we're amazing people. We just keep going. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, we survive. And and no wonder we're kind of resilient. We're just resilient. Yeah, we are. And there's a way through this. There but is. And part yeah. of it involves doing what we're doing today. It's yeah. finding language. Mm -hmm. It's sharing the language, yeah. talking, connecting, um, so that the shame comes out from hiding. So mm -hmm. that anyone who's listening, who hears something that's like, oh, that's it, mm -hmm. feels an instant sense of relief. Yeah. Um, so it's just, it's important work that you're doing. It's to helping to locate what this work is, right? Mm -hmm. that, that so much of this um, is so disenfranchised, is, is so isolated that we don't know that others are going through it and feeling it and experiencing it. And it is so normal, right? That it is so normal and that there's nothing wrong with us for being in this place. And there's a way forward. Right. The term disenfranchised grief really started to make sense for me when I read the memoir um, about the mom whose son was responsible for shooting um, his fellow students in the um, high school Columbine massacre. Where does a mother go with that grief? I mean, I can't even imagine her isolation and pain because her son did such a monstrous thing, and yet that's her baby. Yeah. Um, I think that's when that concept really hit home in a real guttural kind of way, like, oh. Um, and... So I've also heard people talk about disenfranchised grief who have been the, quote, guilty partner in a relationship where they are the ones that had an affair. Mm -hmm. 
So where are they supposed to grieve? I mean, they're going to maybe try to save their marriage. They're going to be remorseful. But what about the fact they lost someone they actually maybe cared about, the affair yeah, partner? The like, affair partner. You, but because you're the bad person, you don't get to grieve that. So these are other examples of disenfranchised grief that I think are um, necessary real- to bring into the conversation. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, it's it's a big, huge piece of the healing is that we need to make spaces to grieve. Even if we feel bad. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, that circles us, I think, back around to these feelings of uh, how we have to be good or we have to be pleasing to others. And um, that, you know, part of the healing is perhaps that we we don't. <laughs> always need to be orienting ourselves towards what others think. That's beautiful and well said. Yes. I think it's Pia Melody that says we need to uh, be internally validated rather than externally validated. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great goal. I I think it's really hard. It's really hard. (laughs) It's really hard. (laughs) I, I think to some degree as relational creatures, especially women, that we are really I mean, we're so sensitive and finely tuned to yeah. the gestures, the facial expressions, the body movement of those that we care for and live yes. with. And so even without language already picking up how somebody feels about us. I mean, yeah. And so to tune that out and tune into ourselves takes really a... Well, a I wonder if it's about tuning it out or if it's about tuning in, right? So that we can pick up on what's the information that we're getting from the outside world, and are we also paying attention to what's happening inside? I think you're exactly right. I think in a healthy, um, recovered kind of way, there's a capacity to do both. Yeah. But the women I work with, before they've tuned in, have to almost tune out first, Mm -hmm. which is why withdrawal is so effective, because you literally have to tune out. Yeah. Now, obviously, if you have children in your care, you can't, but you have to tune out from a partner. Mm -hmm. in order to tune in for the first time. Yeah. And then later you can hold both, but not usually at the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. That's hard work. It's really hard work. Yeah. 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 Kelly, where can folks that are interested in um, learning more about this or finding resources to deepen this piece of their work go to learn more? Where would you direct them? Would you direct them to your website? To Well, let me just be clear. Um, if they want to learn more about um, which how part heal. of what we've oh how to heal love addiction. Well, so is so I, I mean, I think, I think your book, Ready to Heal, Breaking Free of Addictive Relationships, and your upcoming book, Mother Hunger, are amazing resources that folks should begin with um, for much of what we're talking about in today's conversation. If you are listening to this and you want more help for having grown up missing so many things that you needed, find a therapist who is, one, attachment-oriented, mm-hmm. two, somatic-trained. In other words, they've done some training on the body on the and body. trauma, like with Pat Ogden or Peter Levine's model. And um, three, that they have a sense of how to do EMDR with an attachment focus. So that's Laurel Parnell's work, Dr. Laurel Parnell. She has taken the standard EMDR protocol, which is great for trauma, but really expanded it to include attachment, which is better for complex trauma. And what we're talking about is complex trauma here. Yeah, we are. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So hopefully that helps. That does. That does. And then if folks want to follow you, Mm -hmm. I know you're pretty active on Instagram. I am. I'm doing my best. I'm learning. I feel so um, humbled. Many, times. <laughs> but I'm, I'm, it's some days. It's creative and kind of fun. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I am posting. I'm posting regularly um, quotes from my new book and um, and just relevant quotes to addiction and mother hunger. Yeah. And what is your um, Instagram handle? I'll put it in the show notes. But oh. so folks can just go right there right now as they're listening, and they can find yeah. you and follow. It's Kelly McDaniel Therapy. Perfect. So it's that little A sign and then yeah. Kelly McDaniel Therapy. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. And we'll make sure to have a link in the show notes that you can easily just click on to find your way there. But that would okay. be a great way for folks to follow your work and to to stay abreast of um, kind of the, the beautiful teachings that you're putting out into the world. Thank you. I think for now, it is definitely the best way. I have hopes that maybe next summer or 
late spring, even some of what we talked about around disenfranchised grief. And mm-hmm. maybe there's a, a way I can put some groups together for people that resonate with mother mm-hmm. hunger to talk yeah. with each other, but we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. Get the book published first. Yeah. 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 One yeah. thing at a time. Yeah. <laughs> but I think that would be something that's well received by by this community here on earth. I, I think it's necessary. I think it's yeah. necessary. It may not be me that does it, but it's necessary. It is. So, it's necessary. Uh, it is. It is. Yeah. So I so appreciate your interest in my books and, yes. and in talking about connection and disconnection. And I would love to have you back on closer to when you're publishing Mother Hunger to talk really deeply about what exactly Mother Hunger is. Oh, that would be delightful. Okay. That would Thank be delightful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me and for your really sophisticated questions. Thank you for joining me. All right, friends, that's it for today. But before you go, I just want to remind you to check out my six-week online course, Supporting Your Relational Self, and my two-day online relationship boot camp. Both are available at connectfulness.com slash offerings and also Don't forget to go over to whydoesmypartner.com and send us a question for the new podcast. Can't wait to hear from you. And I look forward to seeing you again pretty soon with another episode. And if you want to support the ongoing production of this podcast, the best way that you can do that is to simply subscribe and rate the show on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast platform. And then share it with folks. Let them know what you liked and why you liked it. I would greatly appreciate that. I want to express my deep gratitude for Sarah and Chris Ferris, the musicians behind the beautiful soundtrack for the Connectfulness Practice podcast. They recorded and mixed the soundtrack at Kidney Stone Studio. This podcast is produced by me, Rebecca Wong, and copyrighted by Connectfulness Counseling. Until our next episode, take care, stay healthy, Be well.